Hello friends, my name is JJ, and today I want to talk to you about American democracy. Specifically, a once contentious debate about how voting should work, that's largely forgotten today. I refer, of course, to the debate between private ballots and government ballots. You see, for a long time, it was considered perfectly acceptable for people to make their own ballots and vote using those, which obviously contrasts quite a bit with the system we use today, where we vote using ballots that the government provides for us. Government-provided ballots are now so mainstream, I don't think most of us ever even pause to imagine that voting could possibly possibly work any other way. But in the late 19th century, it was actually a fairly controversial idea. And after reading a book about the transition, this excellent book by Alicia Yin Cheng, this is what democracy looked like, I have to say the debate is not entirely as one-sided as I expected. I still think that government provided ballots are probably better overall. But I think that private ballots have some surprisingly persuasive arguments in their favor as well. In fact, I think bringing back private ballots as an option could possibly even help drive up democratic participation in elections for reasons I will get to in a bit. But first, let us hear a quick message from today's video sponsor, HelloFresh. Hello friends, and welcome to the JJ McCullough Test Kitchen. Now, as anyone who knows me can easily attest, there is nothing I hate more in this life than cooking. I eat out for dinner every single day, which is extremely financially irresponsible, but that is how deep my hatred of cooking goes. So can today's sponsor, HelloFresh, fix me? HelloFresh is a subscription service where they send big boxes just like this one straight to your doorstep so you can make delicious meals in the comfort of your own test kitchen. I must say they have a truly amazing array of meals to choose from with choices compatible with all of the wonderfully elaborate dietary restrictions that define our modern age. Since I am a vegetarian, I was able to get this North African inspired falafel and green couscous as one of my meal options. In the box, they have the exact proportion of ingredients you need along with this idiot proof recipe card, which is great for me because I own no ingredients and barely know how to boil an egg. So let's give the HelloFresh system a try. So here, you see, even JJ could pull it off. If you're interested in joining the HelloFresh family and saving money and eating healthy by cooking your own food in a sustainable, earth-friendly way, why not click on the link in the thing below and use the promo code HFMCULLOUGH to get savings equivalent to 20 free meals and free shipping on your first box. HelloFresh, if they can get me to cook, they must be doing something right. So in the very earliest days of American democracy, voting was simply done by going to a voting place and telling some guy who you wanted to vote for, which he would then diligently write down in a record book. This is still the system used in a couple of American elections to this day, most notably the famous Iowa caucus that until recently was the first round of voting for presidential party nominees. But as the Iowans themselves recently demonstrated, in-person voice voting can be a very logistically difficult time-consuming system, especially when the pool of eligible voters is quite large. Voice voting is a system that arose at a time in which voting in general was only open to a small number of land-owning white men, so as voting rights expanded, a more efficient system of recording the preferences of all of these new voters became necessary. Public voice voting can also be quite embarrassing and even dangerous, particularly in the context of late 18th century politics where communities were smaller and more tight-knit and openly declaring your honest political opinions if they were at odds with the majority could subject you to social ostracization and harassment and possibly even violence in some cases. It was for these reasons that in the early 19th century, states began switching to paper ballots, a system that was both more efficient as a matter of procedure and more private at a time when the right to keep your political opinions to yourself was starting to emerge as more of a social norm. As the 19th century progressed, the good old Industrial Revolution also made it cheaper and easier than ever to mass produce low quality paper documents for all sorts of casual day-to-day -day uses. It is wild to think that something as common as paper was once a somewhat rare consumer good, but for a large chunk of the 1800s it was, 
And this had some consequences for the debate about ballots that was to follow. As the concept was originally understood, a paper ballot was simply a piece of paper that you brought to the voting place to be collected in a container of some sort and read and counted at a later time. Those lucky enough to have access to their own scrap paper could just write down the names of the candidates they wanted to vote for. But since a lot of people didn't have a lot of excess paper just lying around, they would instead have to go somewhere to pick up a pre-made ballot and take that piece of paper to the voting place. And who made those ballots? Well, usually the politicians and political parties themselves. Initially, these were nothing more than a little piece of paper with the names neatly printed on them. But as printing technology became more sophisticated, so did the ballots. Much of Alicia's book features scans of some of the more aesthetically pleasing pre-made ballots that America's various parties and politicians churned out in the latter half of the 19th century when ballot making had really become a high art. Another name for these sorts of ballots were tickets, and it's from this that we get the expressions of people running on the same ticket or voting straight ticket. Because of course, since the political parties were often printing these things themselves, they would print the names of all of their candidates running for office in that year's election on the same ticket. So when you went to vote, all you had to do was submit a single piece of paper. If you wanted to vote for someone from a different party for one of these offices, you were free to modify the ballot by gluing on some other name or whatever. But the hassle of doing this compared to the convenience of having a pre-made ballot was one of the many ways that the parties of the time benefited from the private ballot system. Though it should also be noted that in those days, political parties were themselves a relatively new concept. So the idea of not just voting for all of the candidates of a single party was seen as the weirder thing to do. I mean, if you like a party, you should theoretically like everyone that party is running, right? In the 1860s, 70s, and 80s, pre-made ticket ballots were one of the leading symbols of American democracy. Party supporters would hand them out on street corners as part of campaigning, and the attractive designs, which could feature all sorts of interesting typography and slogans and cartoons, were an important way for politicians to market themselves and their issues to the public. But as the years went on, pre-made ticket ballots became a leading symbol of everything that was wrong with American democracy as well. The late 19th century was a time of quite rampant political corruption across the United States, and one of the ways this was seen to manifest was through the phenomenon of so-called ward healers, dodgy people who worked for the big political parties and were tasked with wrangling big mobs of voters to cast ballots on election day. They used all sorts of shady tactics to do this, including bribing them with liquor, gathering up freshly arrived immigrants who barely knew what an election was, or even extorting people with threats of violence. And of course, they'd always have a big stack of ticket ballots to press into everyone's hands as they corralled them into the voting place. To reformers of the era, all of this made a mockery of what elections were supposed to be, namely a mature intellectual contest of competing political visions, not some shallow exercise in herding a bunch of slack jaws clutching tickets into the local community center like you were some carnival barker rounding up audience members to attend the local freak show. Likewise, as we alluded to earlier, being able to mass produce ballots was hardly a skill that everyone had access to in an age before computer printers and photocopiers and buying big slabs of paper for $6.99 at Walmart. The fact that having access to industrial scale printing had become such a vital part of winning elections was accordingly seen as yet one more way in which the 19th century American election regime had evolved to favor the interests of the wealthy and well-organized established political parties over more change-oriented outsider candidates. As a result, American progressives began to envy how elections were run in Australia, which was a democratic country that was quite culturally similar to the US, but seen as having a much cleaner political culture. In Australia, rather than having voters bring in their own pre-marked ballots, the government would print and distribute blank ballots at the voting place. And these blank ballots would have the names of all of the candidates of all of the parties 
arranged alphabetically without any slogans or decorations, and the voters would have to put a little check beside the names of the people they wanted, and then put that filled-in ballot into the container to be counted later. To the reformers, the so-called Australian ballot system seemed deeply sensible, and obviously it proved to be a persuasive idea. By the early 1910s, all of the American states had switched to the Australian system, and today it is hard to imagine things ever being done another way. But there was considerable pushback to the idea at the time, and not just because fans of the status quo were pro-corruption either. Did I leave the stove on in the test kitchen? Oh well, HelloFresh has provided me with so many delicious meals at a reasonable price, I'm sure I can afford to burn a couple. So one criticism of the Australian system was just that it made voting way too complicated. You have to remember that the late 19th century was a much less bureaucratized society than the one we inhabit, and most people rarely came into contact with law and complicated paperwork requiring a lot of reading and filling out. So if you were, say, some poor, uneducated Victorian-era farmer being given some giant ballot that looked like this, with all of these names and positions to read through, could be seen as a process that was intentionally intimidating and confusing with the intent of possibly tripping you into making mistakes. Though the Australian system gave voters the agency to pick whatever candidate they wanted for every office, as opposed to using a straight ticket with a complete list of candidates from a single party, it is also true that a lot of voters didn't want to make all of these decisions, and were perfectly fine just trusting their party of choice to decide who should be the supervising county commissioner or whatever. This is a debate that is still with us, the idea of whether it is better to vote for a party or a person, and whether there are some government jobs that really shouldn't be subject to competitive election. But the most consistent criticism of the Australian system was just that it gave government too much power over the democratic process. Voters were being asked to give up a right they had traditionally enjoyed, the right to make their own ballots in favor of trusting government to make ballots ballots for them. And this, of course, was in addition to the fact that they already had to trust the government to count the ballots and run all of the polling places. You can imagine how in the context of late 19th century political corruption, a request like this could seem like a deeply counterintuitive thing to want. If government controlled the making of the ballots, what was to stop them from just secretly printing a bunch of extra ballots and rigging an election that way? Since all of the ballots looked the same, it seemed harder to verify the validity of a pile of votes. A party auditor couldn't come by and be like, yup, this is one of ours. They'd just have to be like, well, this anonymous this generic piece of paper says that some random person voted for the Tweed party, so I guess we just have to trust that the Tweed party elections administrator is being honest in counting this as a valid vote. Indeed, as Alicia notes in her book, a big part of the reason why the Australian system caught on so quickly was entirely because the partisan machines that ran many state and local governments at the time realized that they had a lot to gain by consolidating their power over every aspect of administering elections. The speed by which the new system was adopted was not necessarily the result of honorable statesmen protecting the integrity of American democracy. State legislators controlled all aspects of the bureaucracy, consolidating the balance of power and allowing them to wield partisan influence more effectively and efficiently. With the adoption of the Australian ballot, parties were able to create laws that could work in their electoral favor without the trouble and expense of printing their own tickets or hiring an army of party healers to rally votes one by one. Particularly in the Deep South, the adoption of the Australian system heralded the dawn of things like literacy tests, poll taxes, restrictive ballot access laws for candidates wanting to run, and other bad faith policies designed to make the government-run procedures of voting antagonistic to the sorts of voters and politicians a particular government didn't want participating in the democratic process. And to a degree, these debates are still with us to this day, with government not always considered an entirely trustworthy actor when it comes to setting election rules. This has always been one of the inescapable paradoxes of democratic government, in fact. The degree that we trust politicians to neutrally administer a process that they have such a strong vested interest in the outcome of. Now, I don't think anyone can seriously argue that we should return entirely to the system of privately made election ballots. Paradoxes aside, over the course of the last century, the administration of elections has undeniably become much less partisan and much more 
professionalized, and in the context of a middle-class society defined by orderly, predictable procedures and paperwork, the idea of mass-produced, government-made, generic-looking ballots now strikes most of us as a very sane and efficient way to document and count votes. But I do sometimes wonder if enough time has now passed that bringing back private ballots as an option could be something that we could reintegrate into the democratic system without too much trouble. As long as there were some standards, like that any privately made ballot had to fall within certain size and weight restrictions and couldn't be made of dangerous materials and things like that, I don't see why it would be so much of a problem to allow some voters to bring their own ballots to the voting place if they so chose. For political parties, returning to the practice of handing out pre-made ballots to prospective voters could be a good way to make their political advertising more memorable and meaningful. Those flyers that the politicians stick in your mail slot could now double as both election reminders and your ballot. They'd be things you'd save in your home to remind you to vote and then carry with you on election day. As popular as it may be to hate election advertising these days, it does serve a useful purpose in helping inform and motivate voters, which is a democratic good unto itself. Now, the parties would almost certainly use the re-legalization of private ballots as an opportunity to once again push people to do more straight ticket voting by distributing pre-made ballots with the names of all of a party's candidates for all open offices. But it's not like people aren't already doing straight ticket voting in massive numbers anyway, even without pre-made ballots. Likewise, in the old days, one of the reasons why reformers were critical of straight ticket ballots was because they were hard to modify, even if you wanted to. Voters who wanted to elect someone from the other party for secretary of state or whatever would have to somehow get access to paper and glue and scissors to make an edit, which were less common things in those days. But today you could imagine the voting places just having a big pile of stickers and markers, so it wouldn't be that much of a hassle. But the thing that intrigues me the most about private ballots is just how well they would integrate into our modern era of social media. I mean, as it stands now, a lot of places don't let you take photos of ballots or when you're inside of the voting booth. But if you had access to your ballot ahead of time, there would be nothing to stop you from taking selfies with your pre-made ballot at home and raising awareness of the election that way. And for the arty types, just imagine how much Viral content could be generated from artists and graphic designers showing off their homemade ballots in the lead up to voting day. This would almost certainly become one of the major traditions of election season, in fact, seeing all of the fun and creative ballots people would be churning out to flex both their artistic skills and partisan allegiances. Would it get a bit obnoxious at times? Sure. Would it make counting votes on election night take slightly longer? No doubt. But at a time when voter apathy is a real problem and enthusiasm with the democratic process is dangerously low, I don't think it would be the worst thing in the world to test out a gimmicky idea now and then. I mean, Australian style ballots were a gimmicky idea at one time too. So that is my big idea to save democracy. Let me know what you think in the comments. Do not forget to check out HelloFresh and I will see you all next week.